it's nice to have a voice of sanity. Uh, <laughs> I mean, geez, a deal. I thought that the cray cray had ended on Saturday, but you know, I of course am too optimistic. The cray cray I, continues for another sixty or so days, I guess. Well, I mean, I guess that that brings me to my first question. Uh, let's talk about this. I mean, the uh, Trump administration, and you heard Mitch McConnell, I'm sure, Neil today, standing in lockstep with the president about the fact that uh, he is going to continue to pursue this le these legal challenges, uh, I guess, until he's told he's exhausted them. And even then, it seems the challenges will be continued in terms of the rhetoric. So just tell us, I know he's zero for seven. Can you just give us, first of all, your reaction to Mitch McConnell's statements today? Sure. So, and by the way, he's 0 for 10 at this point. Trump has filed 10 lawsuits since Election Day, lost all 10 of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so McConnell said this. He said, you know, quote, let's not have any lectures about how the president should immediately cheerfully accept preliminary election results from the same characters who just spent four years refusing to accept the validity of the last election. So that's what he says. It is garbage, start to finish. So you know, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see anyone going and contesting the election results in 2016 and filing 10 different lawsuits the way that these folks have. I didn't see anyone, um, you know, saying uh, that, uh, that, uh, you know, that I didn't see Hillary Clinton saying that Trump didn't win. Uh, you know, she conceded on election night. So you've got, you know, this, again, this false equivalence. She conceded the next day, but yeah, the next day. But 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 you know you have this false equivalence between what happened there and what's happening here, in which Trump got beat in state after state after state, um, and you know nobody, no lawyer that I've talked to who has a shred of sanity thinks these lawsuits are going anywhere. Um, and, Before Talk, before we, we get more granular about the lawsuits, was this purely a political calculation by Mitch McConnell thinking he won his reelection bid? He's got to keep the Trump base in his corner as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what's in his head, but it certainly can't be motivated by any sort of assessment of the legal merits of these things. Because even if he wins them all, it doesn't get Trump where he needs to be at all. Trump is too far behind in too many different states. And so it's kind of like a basketball game in the fourth quarter when you've got one minute left to go and you've got one team down by 25 and that team's playing as if the game's tied and they're like, you know, fouling to get free throws and, you know, taking timeouts and stuff. That's kind of the phase we're in right now. It's like a delay for no decent purpose, at least no electorally decent purpose at the end, um, which is just so destabilizing to the United States and its transition. Um, it is, you know, it's, it's their MO. They don't care about any of that. They just care about themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's a very sad thing to, to watch. You said the best law, you have something you're doing on Instagram called Courtside, which is great, Neil, where basically you're kind of breaking down uh, all these different lawsuits and the legal maneuvering the Trump administration is engaging in. And you said on, I guess, one episode that the best lawsuit is one in Pennsylvania that challenges the ballots that have come in after Tuesday. Well, why the hell would that be a strong lawsuit? I mean, the mail-in ballots were, a, you know, didn't they try before the election and take it to the state Supreme Court in Pennsylvania and lose? Yeah, so all that's right. So first of all, yes, I've launched this new thing on Instagram I'm doing every night uh, called Courtside, just two minute videos explaining what's happened. And I did that because basically I didn't know that, I thought you were really too busy doing cameos on the boys and stuff to, to have me on your show. Had I known that I could do this, do it with you, then uh, you know I wouldn't have to announce my it on my, my own. My daughter but, wrote um, that episode. You... My daughter wrote that episode. So it was, it was a little bit of a, you know, what can I say, it was slightly, uh, incestuous, but okay, it was awesome. So, you know, I actually was watching the show with my kids. And so that was so fun to watch, see you on it. Um, here's what I said. Um, you've got these pens, you've got a bunch of different Pennsylvania lawsuits right now, but the only one that has any sort of legal legs behind it is this one that says, 
The Pennsylvania legislature said ballots have to come in on election day. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court extended that deadline by three days. Therefore, you got to throw out the ballots that came after election day in that three day period. Okay. The legally, it's a crazy theory and only a, three justices, uh, you know, maybe now as many as four have ever accepted it in 200 years. So never a majority of the Supreme Court, but it's an argument. Okay. The problem with the argument is not just the law, it's really the facts. Because even if you throw out the ballots after Tuesday, it doesn't matter at all. In fact, the counts that we're all seeing with from Pennsylvania don't generally include any of those ballots. And so it doesn't get Trump where he needs to be. And, you know, so today the White House and the Trump campaign made a whole big deal. Ten state attorneys general joined this Pennsylvania lawsuit and filed a friend of the court brief. They filed the brief on that legal theory that, you know, it's got to come in by election day, not three days later. They pointedly didn't say that, oh, this is going to actually flip the outcome in Pennsylvania. Nothing is going to flip the outcomes here. It's over. I guess, Neil, I'm confused about what you just said about Pennsylvania, because the mail-in ballots are what put Joe Biden over the top. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, can you explain that? Yeah, I might have moved the two quickly. So everyone agrees mail-in ballots count. The question is, when do they have to arrive? And the Pennsylvania legislature, according to Trump's own officials, say as long as they arrive by election day, they can be counted later. They just got to arrive by election day. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court, by contrast, said, nope, as long as they get there by Friday, three days after election day, we'll count them. Now, the counts we have been seeing don't include those Tuesday, post-Tuesday to Friday ballots. There's a couple places in which they do to the tune of, I think, 500 ballots, I'm told, but, but nothing compared to the numbers that Trump needs. That's the problem. He's oh. got some legal claims, but it never gets him far enough. He but, lost by too much. But, but Neil, even if they were counted, the, if the state Supreme Court said they should be counted, uh, wouldn't the lawsuit be, be specious anyway? Well, you'd be talking like a lawyer who um, has read the Constitution, yes. Um, and that's generally, in fact, how every United States Supreme Court has seen this, except for three justices in Bush versus Gore in 2000, in an opinion that nobody thought was particularly credible, never cited before or since. Uh, you know, this theory has never been around before and never cited since by another court, except last week when Justice Kavanaugh brought it back to life um, and said, I think that this theory has some merit. Um, I think he was widely ridiculed for that opinion. Um, it was uh, an unfortunate opinion and had a lot of mistakes in it. Um, and so hopefully he will reconsider that opinion that he wrote. Not to get too much in the weeds, but who were the three justices in 2000 who ruled that way, Neil? Are they still on the high court? Um, no. I, well, maybe I, th I think Justice Thomas was. I think it was Justice Thomas, Scalia, and Rehnquist, if I recall. I, but uh, don't hold me to that. It's been a long time, uh, 20 years. But, uh, but uh, I don't, you know, but th there are now as many as four that may believe the theory, um, you know, after last week's uh, litigation. But so far, not five. And even if, and this is the key point, even if he can get five votes on the legal theory, the facts aren't there. That's his problem. So is this going to reach the Supreme Court at some point, Neil? It is pending before the Supreme Court now. And it's possible that the Supreme Court, um, you know, could take the case, at least if it was seen to matter at all. My gut is they don't. The, the great thing about our Supreme Court is they generally like to stay out of stuff like this. Um, they deem these kind of almost political questions, not places where the court should be. So if it's a last resort situation in which they really felt some sort of widespread fraud was going on, that's one thing. Um, it's a very different thing when you've got this in which you know nobody, and including the Trump officials, have been able to make a plausible claim that this would have changed the outcome. And this is, I think, one really important point that folks haven't understood, because you see Trump and McConnell and all these people going on saying widespread fraud, widespread fraud, and this and that. But when you actually read their legal filings, they don't say that. 
Now, why is that? Because a lawyer who signs a pleading has an ethical duty to not make claims unless they can back them up, particularly allegations of fraud. And so instead, you know, so you have all this political rhetoric about how bad it is, but then when you actually read the legal pleading, it doesn't have all that stuff in it. So um, who's paying for all this? Well, we are in the form of our souls, but, um, uh, uh, you know, I assume the Trump campaign, and it was interesting, Trump has been sending around these emails. Somehow someone put me on the Trump email list, so I get them. And he's begging for money for his legal defense. And there's fine print in the email that says 60% of the money that you donate for his legal defense will actually go to pay the general campaign debts. So it's not even for the legal defense. So if you're asking why is this going on still when nobody thinks this is gonna make a difference, it may have a little bit to do with that. I don't know, but uh, you know, it's certainly in the fine print of the emails. So when will this conceivably end? Will, when will they have exhausted all the legal recourse that they could pursue, Neil, and that someone says it's over, uh, there's, there's nothing we, that can be done here. Well, I mean, in the reality-based community, we are there already. So these lawsuits, none of them matter. Um, so I guess we could sit around and w wait. Okay, in the unreality-based community, how long will this go on where, you know, I, I take your point, but where, you know, it's all gone through the system and nothing is being changed, nothing's being entertained by any judge, whatever, and it's like finito. You know, I don't know. I mean, it might literally be January 20th with these people. Um, you know, it should be finito, um, you know, certainly soon. But, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm someone who generally, you know, follows, the, I follow the rules and believe in them. So, you know, when you've got someone who's so willing to defy, I mean, I don't know if even after January 20th, I don't know if even after Biden's in office, these people will file lawsuits to try and get him out of office. I don't know. Um, but I know that they're all going to be unsuccessful. So I can tell you that. So, I mean, yes, there are going to be a bunch of, you know, spurious claims over the next while, but they're, they're going nowhere. Well, when, what, you know, you talk about these people, the legal team that's leading these efforts, um, uh, his formal legal team doesn't seem to include an, many actual lawyers. Yeah, um, uh, you know, every lawyer that I know, um, you know, and I'm friends with all the Republican, you know, all the Republican lawyers who served at the Justice Department and stuff like that. Nobody I know would take any of these cases. Um, they're they're bogus, and so um, you know, they went looking for a James Baker like figure, um, and they got Rudy Giuliani. Yeah. Okay. Let me do some questions from social. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, actually, that's a good one. What about Biden's legal team? Um, I know that you know some of the people who are involved in his legal team. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about those folks and what they're doing during this strange kind of interim period. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I haven't talked to them, but um, but uh, I can tell you a little about them. So Mark Elias, who's a partner at Perkins Coie, um, he um, uh, started with the recount of the Al Franken recount, I guess now about 12 years ago, uh, and uh, a really, really savvy lawyer um, and has represented the Biden campaign for a while. Um, he's been going around state to state, knocking these cases out. Um, uh, and one of the few lawyers I know who's great at trial, but also great in the Supreme Court, I've seen him argue in the Supreme Court, also phenomenal there. Uh, then there's a couple of other people, Bob Bauer, who was President Obama's White House counsel, and Don Verrilli, who was President Obama's Solicitor General after I left, um, both extraordinary lawyers. And so um, then you've got a whole, you know, I think legal team under them as well. Um, but, um, but from top to bottom, you know, the filings I've been watching them have been Really, really good. I've been pleased with the legal effort. Not to call me right now. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of smart people who are asking some good questions uh, on this. One about the GSA uh, letter. Uh, tell me about that because I don't even know if I'm read in on that, Neil. 
Well, I haven't seen the letter yet, but as I understand it, the head of the General Services Administration, who's supposed to facilitate oh. transition, is saying, I think at least as of um, earlier today, she was saying, well, I don't know that the election is certain enough, so I'm not going to help and sign off on transition. So, you know, basically it means that the Biden team can't get all the passwords and get right into all the information that they need for transition, which is just, you know, um, a sad encapsulation of how these people operate, you know. And in good government, um, it's always about themselves. And, um, you know, what I can't- th are, But I wanted to ask you about Bill Barr. I mean, uh, at this point, I mean, <laughs> What do people think about Bill Barr in the legal community, Neil? Well, I mean, there's a lot of people in the legal community. I haven't heard anyone on the left or the right think that um, uh, that he's conducted himself in a way that an attorney general should. Um, and uh, it breaks my heart. And, um, uh, you know, I've had pretty much every week since he's gotten in, took office, uh, someone from justice, career official, saying, help me get out of here um, or tell me what to do. Um, I've got this dilemma. Um, it has been a top to bottom disaster. Um, and, and I don't mean in a sense of politics. I just mean in the sense of the traditions of the Justice Department, which are not about who's in the White House. There is a set of behaviors and a set of in a, in an expectation of independence that uh, you know, your job is not politics. The whole point of justice, I mean, the reason why Lady Justice is blindfolded is the idea that we make decisions not on the basis of who you are or who you know, but because you get the same rule book. And you've got this guy who is literally letting the president's friends out of jail because they're the president's friends and throwing the book at other people. Um, and there is no excuse for that kind of behavior. Um, and he will go down in history as, you know, if not the worst attorney general to have served, pretty close to it. And what about uh, the president's legal troubles once he's out of office, Neil? Um, you know, I know he's being investigated uh, in New York State. Can you just give for the non-lawyers who are watching uh, people, by the way, like your Hamilton poster, Neil. But can you get, can you? That's from Puerto Rico, too. It's from the Puerto Rico show. I'm obsessed, but that's a whole separate thing. Uh, but can you give, me too, can you give people a sense of some of the charges he may be facing, if at all, once he leaves office? Yeah, you've got three buckets, basically. You've got first bucket, federal criminal charges. So, for example, the first half of the Mueller report uh, or excuse me, the second half of the Mueller report saying that he committed obstruction of justice. Those are federal crimes. And what the Mueller report said is because he's a sitting president, we're not going to indict. So that's available for some other prosecutor to pick up and indict on that. Okay. And how likely is it that that will happen, Neil? Well, it depends on who the attorney general is. Um, but these are, you know, if, if he were anyone else, if he were you or me, you'd be indicted for sure. No question about it. So you know, just viewing it as a straightforward legal case, absolutely certain. So can I, can I ask you a follow up? Can he, you know, and I've, I've heard this discussed, but can he pardon himself? So the best article on this is written and it's called Pardon Me and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, by Brian Colt. And the, the, the answer it gives, it's never been tested. There is a Justice Department opinion which says you can't pardon yourself. Um, but um, it's not been litigated because we generally elect presidents who don't get into these kinds of messes. Um, but I think the weight of scholarly thinking is no, you can't pardon yourself because it puts you, makes you a judge in your own case. So of course that doesn't mean Trump won't do it. He probably will because you know he doesn't care about the constitution. But um, you've got that whole set of charges, you know, obstruction of justice. You have any number of other things we just don't know about because the White House has hid so much information from the public. But presumably, if they don't burn all the files, the next team will come in and start looking at that. So who knows what on the federal criminal side there is. That's bucket one. Oh, wait. Side. 
So there's already an ongoing grand jury investigation in New York about tax fraud, that Trump is basically, you know, part of it is that he expensed his uh, payment to Stormy Daniels as a business expense, um, which I didn't know was a thing. Um, and then he also, I guess, let, inflated the price of some assets to get certain loans and deflated them on his tax returns and the like. So a bunch of financial crimes there. And again, who knows what else might be there, but that's what we know about. And then third is the range of civil lawsuits that he's facing. He's already been faced some from various women who've said um, that he assaulted them. Um, so you could see more of those. You could see financial suits about his business dealings. You've got all of that. You have the possibility of emoluments litigation as well. So that'll largely be on the civil side. So I think those are the three basic buckets. And if you're Donald Trump at this point, you're really dreading not being president because you've had this nice shield around you for four years. And now all of a sudden the chickens are going to come home to roost. You, you've dealt, you know, you've been in government, you know, a lot of people who've worked in government. How is this preventing the transition? Some of the, just the simple nuts and bolts of moving one administration out and another you know, administration in. I know that they've been told not to destroy documents and records and things like that. Uh, do you get any sense that they're going to be recognizing the importance of not doing that? And 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 just explain how how this holdup may be affecting uh, the Biden administration's ability to do its job. Yeah, I think it's really significant, and I don't you know, unfortunately have any faith that they will comply with the law. These people haven't complied with the law for four years. Why are they going to start doing so now? Um, you know, the tone is set from the top. And this is a leader who sets a tone of blow off the law if it helps you. And that's in total contrast to what happened in 2008 when Obama won. And I was there firsthand. I was helping with the Justice Department transition and then came in as part of the very first group of seven attorneys from the Obama administration of justice. I met with President Bush's Solicitor General, Greg Gar, right away and during transition. And he went and spent hours with me. We went down every single case, Katie, in the office and where the potential landmines were. Both, he even flagged the stuff that he said, you know, politically, I could see you guys coming to a different conclusion. Take a look at this case, take a look at that case. It was so beautiful and majestic. It was totally the way you'd want government to operate. And, you know, I'm so grateful to him. And that was a tone set by George W. Bush um, generally, um, you know, that, that to, to facilitate the whole point of government is to try and, uh, you know, make decisions for the American people. That it's not about you. It's about something bigger than you. Um, and so... I loved our transition. I was so impressed with what happened there. And unfortunately, I think we're going to get the mirror inverse of that um, with this. So do you think, I mean, a, a couple of people asked me about, uh, can President Trump be prevented? Sorry, this is kind of uh, a, a different topic. Can he be prevented from appointing electors for himself while these cases play out? Yeah, so he certainly can't appoint any electors. There's some dispute about whether the states can appoint their own slate of electors. And you've got some, you know, fringe members saying, oh, throw out the election results, <laughs> just do it yourself. Um, you know, which I think at its bottom really underscores what this is about. It's about power. It's not about democracy. And if you don't get the democratic results you want, yeah, who cares? We'll just do it another way. Um, I can't imagine that's going to have any legs. I can't imagine even the broken Republican Party as destroyed as it is and having very little of its conscience left um, going along with something like that. And and finally, I mean, are, what, what else concerns you as you look at this period, this transitional period before the inauguration, Neil, you know, from a legal standpoint, from an ethical standpoint, from a constitutional standpoint, whatever, what are some of your concerns about what might transpire between now and, and January 20th? Right. Well, I think the big flaw in our system is that you have a long lame duck period. And, you know, President Trump is fully the president during this time. He has the nuclear codes. 
He can, as we learned today, fire a cabinet secretary, even a defense secretary, even when we know that it's times of transition in which our foreign adversaries test us the most. Um, so I'm worried that he will do anything and everything to benefit himself. Um, and, you know, he's never particularly cared about the American people, but this is now his last, um, last gasps uh, with power. And I do worry that he's going to use it in untoward ways. And so um, I think, you know, the job of your profession, Katie, is to expose that, bring it out to light and give it sunlight. And the job of my profession as lawyers is to go into court and stop that where there's a legal pursuit, a legal remedy to be had. And is there anything that the Biden transition team should be doing that it's currently not doing or, you know, how do you feel about the way it's conducting itself or the team is, is handle or the Biden in, president elect is handling this transition from that point of view? I think it's been great so far. I mean, we're only, you know, 48 hours in to the transition after the call. And, um, you know, I, I, and I felt this too, when I came in, you want to be respectful to these folks who, after all, they've lost their jobs. You know, they're, they're going to be out of government. And so you don't want to be, you know, rushing the field and get in, get in there and, you know, do things and, and so on. You want to listen. You want to have some humility about you. And I think that's the way the transition folks have operated for these days. And, you know, I expect that to continue for a while. Now, at some point, they're going to have to actually do something if, they're, if Trump is going to refuse transition and order his people to stop. And I don't know what that looks like, whether it's a lawsuit or what. But at some point, government needs to get on. And it's not about you, Donald Trump, and your staff. It's about the American people. And, you know, the, you know, they've named a COVID task force, including David Kessler, from, former commissioner of Another person who works at Yale Medical School. Um, so, but but what can these people actually do? We see COVID spiking all across the country. The number of cases is on the rise. We're in the third wave. Um, but but you know what what can they actually get done if they're not in power yet? Right. I don't think they can actually formally get anything done, but I think informally, you know, first of all, just collecting the group of the top scientists and getting them together and starting to develop an action plan is really important. Um, and uh, if it means that none of the playbook gets implemented by January 20th, so be it. I'd like to think that, you know, if they come up with good ideas that the president's team will just accept them and not care where they come from. Look, they can take all the credit. Who cares? Like, you, you know, we're in a pandemic. Um, Neil, do you really think they're going to be receptive to those ideas if they're coming from the incoming Biden administration? Well, look, I mean, hope springs eternal. And we're in a very, very dangerous situation right now. And um, I certainly don't want to write them off. Um, and uh, so... Uh, I, I want every opportunity to engage with the current Trump team um, and to say, if we've got a good idea, just take it, take it, get credit for it. I don't care, you know, but, um, you know, we're in as horrible a situation as one can imagine. So let's hope that people come to their senses. And I heard from somebody on the, that someone on the campaign was recommending rallies and people standing behind the president. Uh, at some point, this has got to run out of gas, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it has. I mean, you know, we can have the rallies, you know, if it makes them feel good, fine, whatever. Just let's get the show on the road. Let's get our government going. Um, we've got a new administration coming in in a little more than 60 days, and, um, and it's a lot of important work to be done. Well, Neil, people can uh, follow you on Instagram. What is your handle, Neil? Uh, it's my name. It's N-E-A-L-K-A-T. Y-A-L. That's N-E-A-L-K-A-T-Y-A-L. And you can and see it, I guess, at the top of your screen. Yeah. And Neil really breaks down things well, everyone. If you want to watch his two-minute uh, courtside analyses, if you're not a lawyer, you can understand what Neil is talking about because uh, he doesn't just play one on TV. He actually is one. Hey, Neil, thank you for... Thank for you.
understand what's going on legally. And if there's a development that you think our followers should know about, will you just ping me and let me know so I can share it? I would love to. Thank you again for having me on. If you guys like what you see, subscribe right here.